and it's happened. We knew it was gonna, didn't we? Sam's phone has indeed rung. Sometimes you've got to take them out of the firing line. It might not be everybody's cup of tea, but that's what I would do. I think they'll stay up by the skin of the teeth, and I'm so hopeful that they do. What are they there for? Get yeah. rid of them. Hold the board yeah. up. I tell you what, this podcast is in jeopardy if Sam Allardyce stops my team winning the league, by the way. so Sam was right about you. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to another episode of No Tippy Tappy Football brought to you by William Hill. And it's happened! We knew it was gonna, didn't we? That's why every single week on this podcast we would ask Sam, has your phone rung? What's going on? Is anyone chatting to you? Well, since we recorded our podcast one week ago, Sam's phone has indeed rung and he is the new manager of Leeds United. But don't fret, don't fret, because... We have a very ample interim boss in place to stand in for Sam. Yes, we are in safe hands because he is a Premier League winner, a captain as well, and of course, a manager. So we're in very, very good safe hands. Tim Sherwood, thank you so much for stepping in and saving the podcast. Pleasure. It was a deal I couldn't turn down, really. You know, for a short period of time, can't go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, we're really thrilled that, you, that you're here. Of course, you were a guest earlier in the season as well, and um, we had such yeah. a great chat that day, so I'm really, really looking forward to it today. Um, and we have a special guest. Would you like to introduce him? Yeah, we have Simon Grayson. He's going to hold um, Big Sam accountable if Leeds get relegated, because he's talking. we're talking to a lifelong Leeds United fan today. So uh, he's an ex-player and very experienced manager, and he's actually managing at the moment in India. So... It's going to be great to talk to him and he's got a lot of experience and a lot of stories. Simon, welcome. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you so much um, for coming in today. And yes, you are a Leeds, former Leeds manager and a Leeds fan. So give us your instant reaction to the Sam News. Well, it's, I think it's a great appointment, to be fair. Not, not just because I'm on the podcast uh, for him, <laughs> but it's uh, I think he's the right person at the right time of the season to try and galvanise a team that's struggling, that needs to shore up the defence, that needs to get points however they can do. And um, there's no better man to go and do it than Sam at this moment in time. And uh, I have texted him this morning to say all the best. Welcome to the biggest team in the world. And you better keep my football club up or else uh, I will get no guests for you to come on this mm. podcast ever again. So <laughs> let's hope that uh, hopefully he can do what every Leeds fan wants him to do. And that's uh, enough points to stay in the Premier League. What did you think when you saw the news? I mean, it happened all very quickly, Tim. Sam to Leeds. What was your initial sort of thoughts? Well, I thought it was inevitable that Garcia had to go. You know, it was just they were just sleepwalking into the championship. And like Simon said, it's a great club, huge fan base, magnificent place to go and play. Um, and haven't waited so long to come to the Premier League um, for it to be taken away from them so soon. No one wants to see it. Let's be honest. Uh, anyone who loves football doesn't want. Leeds United out of, the, out of the Premier League. They've they've spent so many years trying to work their way back there. Bielsen took them there. They've changed their managers numerous times now. So you need someone, even though it's a short period of time, four games just to steady the ship. You mentioned it's four games there. Realistically, you're both managers. What can you do in four games? Pray, especially in his next game. Yeah, probably take the job on Sunday after the Man City game, to be fair. <laughs> It's very difficult, isn't it? You know, but you're going to need a bounce. You see when managers go in, forget it, it's the last four four games. Even when they go in mid-season, um, they normally get a bounce. You know, teams do. Like Simon says there, Man City in the next game. You know, there'll be some bounce, that will. Um, but we saw what happened when Daishi went into Everton. They played Arsenal, who we were top of the league. They win that first game. You know, you pretty much, what, what, what would we say? We're probably going to say... Four points would give them a, a realistic chance to stay in the league. I mean, it's so tight down there. Two wins for sure, I, I think, will yeah. keep them up. And I think four gives them a chance as well. But the goal difference is it's going to be crucial down there as well. It is over the last few weeks when they've been conceding four, five and yeah. sixes. It's been tough for them. And the one thing that Sam has gone in to do is he's got, he, he can't lose, to be fair, because, like you said, they were slipping towards the championship too easily losing and going down with a whimper, not enough tackles, not enough urgency or desire from the team. But he'll go on in and it, people won't expect people mm. to be playing beautiful football. 
if he goes in there and has 10% possession in every game and gets four to six points, mm-hmm. he'll have done the job that everybody wanted him to do. So I, I always think when I watch Leeds play and you've played there and you've managed there and go in there, I think the emotion of the crowd, especially with this, the, the wave after Bielsa, I think almost becomes detrimental to him. Say if they go ahead, they want them to push forward and go and win the yeah. game again and again and again and they make stupid decisions. I think Sam straight away will calm them down and just say, listen, guys, this is how we need to kill the game off. We need to slow it down. If we've got something to protect, he's the master at doing that. But look, the big man would tell us himself, he's not got a magic wand. Yeah. Um, but them Leeds fans expect him to have one. And that's the expectancy level that Leeds fans have. You know what I mean? That... I think the prime example was played Palace a few weeks ago, 1-0 cruising just before half-time and then concede and it's 1-1 and they lose the game 5-1, I think it was, but because the crowd expected them to play the same way as the yeah. first half, but the momentum had changed to Palace and their attacking players, when there's open spaces, went and destroyed them, really. Yeah. But like as you said, Sam will use his experience to sit back, use his knowledge of what players he's got available but also he'll be able to manage the crowd yeah. because they will, as you again said, he'll be wanting to go, the crowd will be wanting to go and get two or three goals when it's 1-0 up. Yeah. Sometimes you have to manage the game better than sort of the cr- crowd He's going to need a goal, won't he? And Bamford, the, other, the chance he missed the other night, you yeah. know, he, he probably still hasn't slept since. Um, so he's going to need him. He's going to rely on him. And I think Carl Robinson going in there as his assistant will help. He had him at MK Dons, you know, he got a tune out of him there. Almost put the boy onto the stage. Um, so him coming back to the club, I think, will give them a list and hopefully Patrick can score the goals. What well, they're going to need to to stay up, but they're going to have to keep the door shut at the other end. And at the moment, the goalkeeper is having an absolute nightmare. Of a well, time. somebody asked me, what would you do if I was going back? I said, I'd drop the goalkeeper straight away. Yeah, Really? Because he's, he's young, he's vulnerable at this moment in time and he's making too many mistakes. Yeah. Sometimes you've got to take him out of the firing line and... Um, might not be everybody's cup of tea, but that's what I would do because I just yeah. think he's vulnerable to making yeah. too many errors, errors that are costing the team too many points. And also the players in front of him are making mistakes, mm. but sometimes you have to make... You can, Sam can't go in and play the same team because he's changing nothing. One thing you do when you're going as a caretaker manager or short-term contract, you have to implement your own ideas straight away and, and that means probably making three or four changes yeah. at the weekend. Well, we know from from Sam talking on this podcast throughout the season that he very much believes that the team that will go down will be the one that concedes the most goals. And the first thing to do is to try and shore up a bit. And we actually had Jermaine Beckford on last week and we had a, the three of us had a really in-depth talk about Leeds and what Sam would do if he was at Leeds. Like, I don't know how we, how, you know, we predicted that because we don't believe his phone had rung at that point. Um, in terms of Carl Robinson, we also had him on as a guest on the podcast earlier this season as well. We've got a cracking record on this podcast, by the way, mm-hmm. for a guest coming on and getting managerial roles. But I wanted to say, obviously, a lot of people are questioning, where's Sammy Lee? Why is he not taking Sammy Lee in? Have you heard why he's not taking yeah. Sammy Lee in? Yeah. Sammy Lee is on jury duty. He's on jury duty. So <laughs> Sam has not been able to take him to Leeds. Do you think you'll miss him, Tim? Well, you miss him because he's had him for a long time. He's his right-hand man there, but there's nothing you can do about it. You know, I think Carl's a good man to get in there. A lot of experience, been around the game for a long time. I think it's rumoured Robbie Keane possibly going in there with him as well. So uh, I, I think he's got a good enough team, but it's all about the main man. Yeah. It's all about it's all about the person who makes the decisions. You know, when you're winning games, sometimes you turn around and you got, you know, you're surrounded by a Right, and men in your technical area. When you're losing games, you look around and you can't see any. <laughs> Definitely, that happens they, all the time. They, don't they blend about that. into the yeah. background, so you, you're they're walking out the gate sometimes. Your front, yeah, <laughs> getting thrown out. Yeah. You, you see, your front and central as a manager. So, and it, listen, we're talking about one of the biggest personalities and most experienced men in the game, or we've seen in the Premier League. So, mm. look, they've certainly shot for the top there, and they got the top one. Um, it's obviously he's not going in there for nothing. He honestly believes it. Sam believes he can keep him in the Premier League. They're not in relegation at the moment. You know, they're sinking into it. Yeah. Um, but other teams down there have still got to win their games as well. And I know from experience, when you're down there, you look at the you look at the games coming up and you never think you're going to win another game. But Sam won't be alone with that thinking. I mean, he's going yeah. in there fresh now. The other managers down there are saying exactly the same thing. You always want the other team who you're playing against 
But you just got to clear your mind and say, what's the worst thing can happen here? You know, you can lose a game of football and you can get relegated. And it'd be devastating, of course, for teams like Everton, who've never gone out of the league, and for Leeds United, who have worked so hard to get back into the league. But reality is, there's people out there leaving, losing their lives. There's a lot worse off people in the world. And you've got to take the pressure off these guys in the dressing room and say, what's the worst thing can happen? We've got to go for it. But we've got to have a structure to how to go for it. And I think Sam gives them the best chance. But I know we're just talking about Leeds' predicament with Sam being in there but and the negativity around results recently. But then you look at the other teams. Everton, Leicester the other night. Yeah. One of them should have won the game the other night. Missed penalties, cost Leicester dearly. Nottingham Forest go to Brentford 1-0 up and then concede in the last minute to lose 2-1. That's a massive body blow to them. Yeah. But it's a positivity for Leeds. And yeah. we're talking, you're finding any reason to be positive being a Leeds fan, believe yeah. me. But these are all things that are going off at every other football club, mm. not just at Leeds, who were sort of in around that predicament. Now you hear the well. managers all the time, and I used to say it, but I didn't. It was it was a total lie. <laughs> you know, when you say, we just got to look after ourselves, we can't worry about what goes on. You spend so much energy watching and praying and hoping the other teams get beat, you know, when they, when they stagger yeah. the games and... I mean, that, it stops you winning. If they get beat, it stops you having to do another job and taking maximum points. I'm point. so glad you've admitted that because I'm always thinking when managers say that, you don't believe you no, don't It's really nonsense. Believe that. So, yes, oh, I was out playing golf or I went shopping with the missus and that's nonsense. They're watching the game and they're praying and the, the heart stops many, many times. And uh, this is the, the, the biggest, I think it's the closest it's ever been. You've been looking at, you know, for a long period, it's probably down to about four or five now. Um, but as a one stage, it was like eight. Eight teams who could have got relegated. Yeah, that is yeah. why you've seen so many changes of management because they panic. People in charge panic, push the button, get someone else in, and they believe they're given that bounce. And that's exactly what Leeds have done. But I'm not sure we've ever seen a change in manager this late in the day. I so. think when you look at Leeds as well, they're looking at probably the model of Crystal Palace, sat Patrick Vieira, and then brought in yeah. probably the most experienced manager in the Premier League and Roy Hodgson and, and the yeah. bounce effect that he had. And, and same with Neil Warnock, I yeah, guess. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's going to keep yeah. them up in the championship. So yeah. for all these dinosaurs that are still going round, yeah. it's still sometimes the best way to have experienced managers in positions rather than young coaches that don't mm. really know how to deal with pressure situations. Yeah. Experience counts for so much. I love that idea. And I heard quite a lot of people talking about that when Sam started getting linked to Leeds, the idea that, you know, how important ex experience really is. Uh, we know that Sam will believe he can keep them up. What do you both think? I mean, I'm sure, Simon, you are hoping and praying. Do you think Sam can do it? Can he keep Leeds in the Premier League? I think they've got the best person to keep them up. If they're stuck with the present coach, then no chance of going down. Where do they go and get another manager that knows the Premier League? So... I think they'll stay up by the skin of the teeth and I'm so hopeful that they do. I'm not sure when the points will be and I would probably think that it will go to the last game against Tottenham at Ellen Road and given you know Tottenham better than I do, what you don't know what team Tottenham are going to, which team Tottenham yeah, yeah. are going to come up. The good one, the poor one or the average one. I just hope it's a really poor one and Leeds beat them on the last day of the season. Yeah, I think what Leeds need to hope for is that Tottenham have nothing to play for on that final yeah. day. Mm. Now it's possibly Europa League spot or Europa Conference League. Um, that I don't think it's a great ground for Tottenham. I really don't. I played my debut there for Spurs and scored a goal, so I, was, I thought I'd just drop that one. <laughs> um, but it was it's, the only goal you scored, wasn't it? It was. Probably, yeah. <laughs> it was in the wrong net. I scored two own goals there for Blackburn actually in the same game. Um, no, it's. Uh, I think I agree. It goes to the last game of the season, and I think with a little bit of structure, what Sam's going to put in place there, and the emotion of the crowd. Um, managed by the players where Sam's going to teach them to manage the crowd I think they will beat Tottenham on the last game of the season and stay in the Premier League Oh now that is I mean my stomach just jumped thinking about that that is some different level of of nerve and, and, and pressure and that crowd at Ellen Road is like, oh, Well imagine. we had it similar when I was at Le in League One with them that we had to win the last game of the season to get automatic promotion and we had 38,000 in there and you're thinking, Bristol Rovers, not going to be too much of a problem for us, home crowd. All of a sudden, we're down to 10 men just before half-time. We go 1-0 down just after half-time. And then we win the game 2-1. So that our every emotion as a manager, as fan, mm. support was going up, down, up, down. And it'll be the same exactly if it goes to the last game of the season this year as well for everybody. If he keeps them up, will there be a statue outside Ellen Road, do you think? Be out next to the burger van. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
if he does keep him up, if it goes well, do you think they will consider him long term? I mean, this you know, it's till the end of the season. I know it's all hypothetical, mm. and you know, I'm hoping obviously not. But <laughs> I think if the if they stayed with the current owners, I think he'd have a great chance because he would have saved them an awful lot of money. And perhaps they would have looked and said, you know what, these experienced guys still know what they're doing. Um, but they won't. It, it, they will have new owners. The Americans will come in, they will take full yeah. control of the, of the club. Um, and they'll want to go and put a trophy manager in there, you know, a sexy manager. You know, I'm not saying it's right, but, the, you know, they just can't help themselves. You Sam know, would say that himself. I mean, he has on the podcast many times. Oh, we've seen them, we've seen them do it, but invariably they fail. You know, they'll turn up there, they'll do the PowerPoint presentation grids, justifications of why they do X, Y, Z. Um, and when the ink's dry, you realise that they're frauds. <laughs> Simple as that. Well summed up, Tim. I love your honesty, Tim. I remember this when you were a guest as well. <laughs> I love your honesty. Um, so, Simon, you are still in management. You're managing in India. I mean, talk about going from crazy fans at Ellen Road. They are hardcore, aren't they? Yeah, it's, uh, I had an opportunity last summer to go, and I just felt... Something different, just managed in, in the UK all my career and what, 18 years now, nearly 800 games as a manager, I thought, yeah, just go and do something different. I was out in India three years ago before the pandemic just to see Martin Bain, who's the chairman of or CEO of the league, and he was my CEO at Sunland, and he said, just come out and watch a couple of games, but it's more the lure of going to Goa for five days, <laughs> just yeah. a bit of a beach holiday yeah. as well that was probably tipped me to go in the first place. And I never once thought that I would take that opportunity, but it came and I thought, why not? And uh, went in July to Bengaluru, which is uh, in the city of Beng Bangalore, which is a great city to live in, completely different culture, um, lifestyle. It was certainly something that is out of my comfort zone and I wanted to test myself. It was too easy just to go and do the, do the same routes that I've done over the last number of years. And I just felt, yeah, it'd be something different. And it was, uh, it's been testing, challenging, but really enjoyed it, to be fair. And the life experience, both professionally and, prof and personally, has been something that uh, somebody who's never probably been out of Yorkshire too much is completely mm. sort of uh, out of my comfort zone, as I mentioned. We hear they love you. Well, that was slightly different in the early part of the season. We, we had a good start to the uh, season. We have uh, the Durant Cup is the equivalent of the League Cup or the FA Cup over here. So it's a big pre-season tournament, which we won for the first time in our history, which was a great start. And then the first eight games, I think we only won one or two and supporters being supporters, go back to England and stuff like that. And then I think it was New Year's Eve, we lost a last minute goal. And the next game we played um, in the northeast of India and playing the bottom team. And it was probably... Really uh, make or break game for us and we scored in the last minute to win 2-1 and then we went on 13 games constant wins we never drew a game never lost a game got to the playoff final lost on penalties unfortunately then we have a super cup at the end of the season which we um, got to the final and lost in that so as it turned out it was a really good season but tinged with disappointment because you got to three finals which no other coach has ever done but we lost two of them it would have been nice just to have won another one but uh yeah, there was a Leeds United fan out there and he um, videoed one of the games when the fans were sitting in my name and it went quite all around the Leeds social media stuff and uh, yeah, it's nice to be recognised and uh, people say nice things about you. What's the level like? So I, I would say probably bottom end championship, top end league one and it's varied really that some of the engine players are decent, some are average, they make poor decisions but yeah. they're willing workers but then you're allowed six foreigners I um, mean, you're right, uh, 20 man squad, four can only be on the pitch at one time. So that's challenging because if you want to bring an, a foreigner on, you have to take one off and you move them all around. Um, but they do make the difference. And I had two Brazilians, two Spanish boys, a Fiji and uh, Australian stroke Croatian. So we had a real mixed bag of, of lads. And it was really sort of weird at first. You, you're talking so slowly, trying yeah. to hopeful that they can understand my Yorkshire twang and my sense of humour. And then all of a sudden, you just go into full full English mode again and they're looking at you as if to say, well, I haven't got a clue what you've yeah. just been talking about. And and that was a learning curve of everything like that. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's been a good experience and I'm going back next year as well. Do you think you'll ever come back to England to manage again? Um, yeah, hopefully. I just looked at this was an opportunity for something different to do. Um, again, a life experience as much as professionally. Um, yeah, I've still got a lot of drive and ambition to be a manager. 
just see see what happens. It's hopefully I can fit into the vogue of the managers that have got experience that have won promotions that uh, we suddenly become fashionable again. I think Big Big Sam will be out there trying to promote that for <laughs> <Yeah>. sure. <laughs> um, of course, as well as being at Leeds, uh, you were at Sunderland and you were there when they were doing the Netflix documentary. My dad loves that documentary. Um, <laughs> what What was it like for you when you were trying to do your day job, trying to do what you're employed to do, but the cameras are following you the whole time? Yeah, not easy. I don't think any manager would be comfortable doing it. Would you want the cameras near you? All I the think time? it's very difficult to to take them out of your mind. And yeah, uh, and I think when you look at the documentaries, it's quite a lot of the time they're acting to the to the cameras, both players and managers, and certainly directors. So it's good viewing, um, fantastic for for the viewer to switch it on. Sort of yeah, light yeah. entertainment, but I think it takes away from the real nit- nitty gritty of, of what's actually actually happening. In well, it's world. also how it's produced as well. I had no input into it. It was already agreed before I went, and what I the input I had into it was they wanted cameras in the dressing room. I said no, you're not filming training when on a Thursday, Friday when we're doing all our main stuff. So maybe you sort of they get a little bit agitated that you're not giving them full cooperation and license to do whatever they want. They wanted to jump in your car when you're just driving home after in a two hour journey after being after a game and you're like, I need my own privacy and stuff like that. And so they didn't get what they wanted all the time, but then you get perceived in a certain way because how it's produced. And what I've said to a lot of people is that they saw me celebrating in a game at Norwich where you got green seats, obviously the colours of Norwich City and but then we score there, but they see me celebrating with goal seats behind me at Hull City away. And it's like, you've not even produced the the actual footage mm. together. And then we were doing, um, um, I was doing, a, I let them do, um, filmers doing the um, um, match presentation. But everyone thought that it was like 45 minutes before the game. It was three hours before a pre-season game at the, at the um, at our training base. And everyone thought, well, I'm not a great man manager or motivator. You don't motivate players three or four hours before a, a match day. And, and so you see that um, side, but people don't understand the timing of that meeting. And then the, probably the biggest thing was people said, oh, you, sometimes you didn't come across as if you were bothered about the club. Well, part of my contractual settlement was that I still had to do interviews for them. So three months later after I left, I'm in a hotel in London, three different shirts on, talking about previous episodes of the season that had already happened. So I'm not going to speak too openly, motivated about a football club that I'd already been left and sacked from anyway. So people don't know too many things. <laughs> well, they don't see that at the time. Yeah. It's only when I put out stuff like today and other times with other interviews that people actually then realise that it's it's not all in sync of everything that uh, has happened, actually. Wow. So after you left, you had to keep doing the interviews for the programme as if you were still yeah, there. Yeah, we, we had like a, a two a morning in London where they talked about the transfer window in August, how it was, how I felt it had gone, and then maybe change shirts into a different room, talk about a recent run of results, how it was going. But this was like November, December time, and I'd been left the club two months before that. So, yeah. People see it in different ways. And, and they are decent at times, but when you're in them, you don't need to uh, watch it too much often. I only watched the first four episodes because I knew what happened in f- episode four that I'd got sacked. So I left it after that. <laughs> <laughs> it got better. <laughs> <laughs> Ask Chris Coleman because he got sacked at the back of it as well. <laughs> Everybody's had one these days, so aren't they? Obviously, Spurs have um, had yeah. one um, as, as well, Tim. In terms of Spurs, what's your kind of take on the current situation, which is just very, very Spurs? Yeah, I think it'd be difficult for them to finish in uh, sixth place this year. I really do. I think it's some. They're going to need to win probably three of, uh, of the last few games and rely on other teams to drop points. So, yeah, it will be an absolute disaster for Tottenham to finish out of out of Europe entirely. Um, but it's not unrealistic where we are at the moment. Um, they've chopped and changed their managers. It's almost like a hopeless task for for Ryan Mason going in now. He's trying to do his best. Good lad, you know, knows knows the game very passionate about the club um but you know they've made some mistakes certainly this year more than more than any years you know the stellini taking over from conti one i just couldn't fathom that i mean it's just 
I had no idea why someone's assistant would stay on and take the job and just do exactly the same thing. So um, I thought it was the right decision to get rid of him and let Ryan have a go. But obviously, you know, the, uh, the game against Liverpool is a difficult one to take. Um, and they've got some tough games coming up. Uh, and Leeds away at the last game of the season is obviously going to be a huge game. And, and Tottenham are going to need something in that game, I would suggest. And I think Leeds might want a little bit more. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's going to be tough. They really let me down. I really thought they were going to stop United getting in the Champions League. That would have just made me... Yeah, I really did. Yeah, I, I mean, they were capable, but I think they was in a false position. I think if you'd watched Tottenham this year, um, it's not been a pretty watch, but I think their, their actual victories um, have just been because of one man, really. Harry Kane has just pulled them out of the fire time and time again. And... Uh, and and he continues to do that, and he will continue to do that. If um, will he stay? If they if they can just keep the door shut at the other the other end, but I'm not sure they can. Will he stay at the club? I'm. I think he was. Um, I think he's got a tough decision to make. He knows he, he you know he's, if you cut him in half, he bleeds the colour of the club. He really he loves it there, but in the end, he needs to win trophies. I believe if, if it was me, I would certainly look to go and. Join a club who I felt was the best equipped to win a win a cup. Uh, or, Don't say or that's a Manchester United, please. Well, it be it will be Man United or Chelsea, won't it? You want to? I believe you'll want to stay in the in the Premier League because he'll want to chase down Alan Shearer's record. If he stays in the Premier League, he will smash Alan's record, which is phenomenal achievement. Um, but Alan will always have something over him, won't he? A championship winners medal, and and I think. Harry, well, all of us, we were growing up, we, we play football because we want to win, not because yeah. we want the big cars and the big houses and loads of money. That doesn't come into it. It's just about you want to be lifting trophies and you want to be successful with your with your teammates. And, you know, unfortunately, he hasn't, he hasn't tasted that, which is, which is hard for one of the, the best players we've ever seen in the Premier League. But still not over. He's, he's still a young man. He's a very fit guy as well. 29 at the end of the season. He's got one year left. It's a big decision, not only for Harry Kane, but for Daniel Levy. Because if he doesn't sell him, he's got to give him away like he did to Sol Campbell. And we know when Sol went to Arsenal, what happened? He won everything. So He won't go Arsenal though, will he? <laughs> Arsenal's out, out of question. Out of the question, yeah. Arsenal. But I just got this. I could not rule out Chelsea. I really, really? couldn't. Man United or, or Chelsea or he stays at Tottenham. I think that's his options. Well, Chelsea think... need a centre forward, don't they? Yeah. And they've got the money to blow everybody out of the water. Yeah. So it does seem. Thing is, si, with him, happen. he you put him into Arsenal, Chelsea, Man United, automatically they're second favourites to, yeah, exactly. to Man City, Definitely. and rightly so because he's a game changer. Definitely. He is. He's, he's, he's not a flash in the pan. The guy's done it for ten plus yeah. years. You know, twenty goals plus every single season. He's consistent. He knows what he's doing. Um, and it'll be very interesting to see what he decides to do. But I think the man who's in control is Daniel Levy because if he doesn't want him to leave like he didn't last summer, he won't go anywhere. Do you think that... Like, it, oh, you almost feel like it's a bit that will be... If he wants to leave, you feel like it'll be unfair. If you, I, I mean, I've often heard people saying that he isn't one of the greatest because he's not won anything. Mm. Is that fair? Well, not really. Not really. I don't think it's hard to judge that um, because you have to look at what he's achieved in, in the side what he's been in. And they've not been poor sides, they've some very good sides. But um, like this season, for instance, the goals what he scored just behind Erlen Haaland. I mean, look at the support act, what Erlen's got yeah. compared to Harry Kane. I mean, it's just... Well, he's had 10 assists from Kevin De Bruyne. You can't compare it, you know. Uh, but Harry will just keep playing and doing his best at all time. His, his mental capacity is outstanding, you know. But, but that what makes it the difference between him and other players is that and his success is that he's not been playing with as good as players as De Bruyne week in yeah. and week out. So to keep, to get, to keep getting 20-odd goals every yeah. season, not respect for the Tottenham players because there's some really good players, yeah. but not all of them have the same quality that Man City players are. Yeah. And they would be creating probably a lot more chances than Tottenham have done. Yeah. But what he does is when he gets two chances, he scores at least one of them, doesn't he? Yeah. And it's not only that. If you look at the assists for the other players yeah. who score goals, they're Harry Kane. 
he comes deep, he finds Son, you yeah. know, he's, he's an assister of, of goals as well. So he's a whole round team player. And like I say, he changes the fortunes of Man United, Chelsea and Arsenal if he was to go at either of them clubs um, next season. But I wouldn't hold my breath. I think there's a good chance he might stay at Tottenham. Um, but that will be down to the, the, the man who's in charge, which is Daniel Levy. Really, really don't want him to go to Manchester United. <laughs> really, really don't want that. Because why don't City get in there and go with Haaland and, and Kane okay, up front? Why not? Haaland and Kane and World Cup oh. winner Julian Alvarez. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so do you, if, we, if I was going to push you, Simon, and say, will Harry Kane be in a Spurs shirt at the start of next season? I, th- I think he will be. Just because I think Daniel Levy, as Tim said, will do whatever he can to keep him, offer him a fortune to stay. Maybe assurances that they're going to go and spend big. The coach is going to come in, he's going to be suited with Harry and everything like that. So mm. I think sometimes it's an ego with the people above and they'd rather lose somebody for nothing than actually sell them um, for X amount of money. So mm. I think so. But again, it could all change as well. <laughs> Yeah, no, I guess, of course, we don't know who the Spurs boss is going to be next season well, as well, which might be a big factor on it. Nor does Daniel. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you hear uh, Javi Alonso was linked? Yeah, I can imagine that. Yeah, Anyone who's in vogue gets an opportunity to manage Tottenham. We'll go back. You go back and I'll come with you. They need a structure. That's what they need. They need a structure. And it's not only the, the management. Um, it's about the recruitment, first and foremost. And they have spent money. I think they're the fourth highest spenders in the Premier League, you know, over a period of time. Um, but it's not about how much you spend, it's what you spend it on. Um, and it's no good if if every five players you sign, only one of them's any good. Um, and that's probably the ratio what they're hitting at the moment, which is which is not good enough for a club like Tottenham. When you look at a club like Brighton, where every player they bring to the club and manager seems to work. So must it's be a, insane. Must How be a structural thing. You know, there might be some thought gone into the due diligence of bringing in managers and due diligence of bringing in players and actually sporting directors um, and the and support staff. I think they get it right rather than a scattergun approach regarding your recruitment at every level. Well, that's uh, where it's probably gone wrong for Chelsea as well, isn't it? Absolutely. I know we're getting away from top of Tottenham, but Chelsea have got all the money in the world to spend and they've just gone and blown it on. Yeah with no thought process of what they need, where it's going to go and play. They've just gone and got, well, we'll get him, him and him. He's a big name. Looks like we're spending loads of money, but it doesn't fit into the structure of the team. Well, yeah. there's no point spending that money sometimes, is no. there? I mean, they've got so many, I mean, 30 odd players. I mean, what they need now is an architect and a yeah. planning officer <laughs> yeah. to increase that training ground more than anything. I mean, it's in- incredible how you get so many players in, in one training ground. It's, it's just a nonsense, really. But I'm sure that if it's Pochettino who goes in there, they've got the correct man to do the job. Someone who will buy into a, the, a long-term project and build. But you've got to let the football men take control of it. And I don't think he will go in there unless he has full control. And I think uh, Todd Bowley and the, the, the powers that be there will realise in the end, leave it up to the man, trust him. He, he did it at Tottenham. You know, people say we well, didn't win anything, but nor did Jose Mourinho, nor did Antonio Conte, and all the other managers they've had previously. But who did the best? Who took them to the Champions League final and a couple of League Cup finals? Pochettino, Champions League, time and time again, qualification. The guy is a very, very good manager, and I think Chelsea have stole a march. If it's him, they've stole a march on Tottenham because I can't believe that Daniel Levy hasn't picked up the phone to that man. Do you think, obviously, at Chelsea, Frank's having a really tough time with it. I think it's six games, six losses, uh, something like that. Does his career survive this, Simon? Well, if you look at all the media reports, people are saying that he's, he won't get a Premier League job off the back of it. And I suppose, given what happened to Everton mm-hmm. as well, it's going to be very difficult. Look, I think Frank's a, a decent coach, um, has, has done well at certain clubs as well. Maybe he has to take a press of reset button and go back to a championship club and maybe build a club and when he was at Derby he brought in the players from on loan signings, developed the younger players um, because it does affect your credibility but also it affects your confidence as well in yourself. If you lose games and get sacked and not do well, you do have doubts about are you good enough to do things. Frank will be a strong character because he's been a strong character right the way through his career playing and managing but he will have doubts of thinking what level he's going to go at, will people touch him again. Sometimes you might have to take a, a back... A little bit of a back step, reset the button again, go again yeah. and build your credit back up again. Yeah. 
Now, I've got two managers here, so I want to get your opinion on something that happened in that Spurs game, but not involving the players. Um, We saw Klopp running down and celebrating in front of the fourth official. Um, And he he had a lot of criticism to say about the referee after as well. What do you make, Tim, of that? The way that he celebrated and the way that he criticises the the officials? Totally understandable. (laughs) I've done it myself so many times. (laughs) Listen, when you're sitting in your armchair, you think that's out of order. You can't do that. You can't behave like that. When you're in that technical area, I'm telling you, different animal. I mean, something just takes over you. I've done it time and time again, you know, and afterwards you go, look, I apologise for that. I shouldn't have done that. But you just get the mist. It comes comes over you. I remember playing, um, we played against Everton at White Hart Lane and was managing and something went on during the game and I kicked the water bottles and they were in the middle of me and Roberto Martinez. And the next thing I turned around and he was just drying himself like this. I said, Roberto, so, sorry, sorry. Mate. It so is. Out. So when I went to, I remember the, the game so I was going to do the same thing when I, went to, when I went to Villa and the bottles were right by their dugout and I was going to boot them into their dugout but I decided went against it and back heeled them and as I've done it I've done exactly what Jürgen done hamstring I mean <laughs> to do it as the first hamstring I've done in my career you have to be quick to do hamstrings and I was never quick but it popped and I couldn't get I, luckily I couldn't get up the stairs to do the press conference after so I had to talk to you guys so uh no it was uh you, you do it. You, something just comes over you and you just become a different animal. But unfortunately, when you in a cold light of day, sitting in your armchair, it's not a good advert. It's not a good look. Um, but I understand what happened. Yeah, look, without a shadow of doubt, we've all run up and down and celebrated in, in different manners. It doesn't look great going up to the fourth official because what's the fourth official probably done? Not what a lot are they long, to be fair. What are they, what are they there for? To probably get abused by managers <laughs> and coaches. Every day. Get rid of them. Hold the board yeah. up. Yeah, yeah, but they don't need to do that now. But they get There's abused by that. everybody and they're not uh, yeah. culpable for anything that they do. They're not making too many yeah. decisions or anything like that. But yeah, you do feel sorry for them. They might as well just have a little area where they can stand up. But then again, I suppose the only reason they're there, there is... To, there's any disagreements between the benches that can like settle things, sort of if there's fighting breaking out and things like that, which we've all seen at times. Um, we're talking about your hamstring. I saw Tony Mowbray he did his as well did for he? Sunderland the other night as well. Yeah, he uh, celebrated, jumped up and down, and next thing he's, <laughs> he's pulling his hamstring. And I've done the same as you when you're in a dugout. Something takes over. I, we conceded a late goal. I don't know where, which team I was managing, to be fair. And I threw a bottle down and it bounced up and I didn't have a clue where it went. So then I got a letter a few weeks later from the supporter saying, uh, disgusted in your behaviour. It landed on my disabled son. I'm like, no way. What, have I, what happened there? Anyway, three months later, actually, it, it was at Huddersfield's ground. And three months later, I got the Huddersfield job. And I made sure that I went up to the person and I said, look, I do apologise and I promise you this will not happen mm. while I'm the Huddersfield town manager. But yeah, there's certain things that happen. You go, why have I done that? But it is, it's just the yeah. adrenaline and the ins- everything, normality goes out of, your, out of your head, doesn't it? What you should be Absolutely. doing and what you shouldn't do. Absolutely. I mean, the, the highs of winning are so high. You know, when you could be winning 2-0 and it's 95 minutes on the clock and you still think you're going to draw the game. You don't know it's over until you're looking at the goalkeeper gets the ball in his hand. You look at the referee, and it's just when he does this, that emotion just comes over you. It's just a fantastic feeling because the lows are so low, and you realise how gut wrenching it is to lose a football match. One of the funniest ones I sort of had was one of my assistants was we conceding last minute again, and the tray of water bottles was there, and he went to. It's always the water bottles, isn't it? Because it's the it. nearest. It's the nearest things there. And he's gone out, I'm thinking, what's he going to do? And he went to pick them up as if to pick them up and then sling them to the floor. They were that heavy, he couldn't, he couldn't <laughs> pick them up. He just took one bottle out and went and threw it down. Went, well, that wasn't even worth it, to be fair. <laughs> and you know everyone saw it as well. <laughs> yeah, everyone, exactly. was, everyone was laughing yeah. and loving that. Um, I guess then, Tim, it's similar sort of feeling then to Arteta. There's been a lot of talks about Arteta this, this season and the way that he is on the touchline or the way that he is outside of his box. Again, are you putting that mm. down to just the... Yeah. Just emotion of it. And especially when you get into April as well, you know, it's, it becomes tough. You know, the running, the emotion, the noise surrounding everything. You know, a huge football club, done a brilliant job there, a magnificent job. Real real structure in place and the playing identity, brave and how they want to go about it. Um, the recruitment's been outstanding. Edu has done a good job in there as a sporting director. He's worked with the manager 
uh, and they've recruited finally uh, good players. Um, but I think they've been helped by that by having a lot of good, very good academy. So a lot of players <coughs> at that club cost them no money at all. So then they can go out and buy Jesus, Zinchenko, Jorginho, players like this who have got winning experience. So they've got a wonderful blend there. Second youngest team in the Premier League. Huge future. Unfortunately, can't see them winning the league this year because you've got a juggernaut like City who, who will not slip up. Uh, but never say never. Just touching on the Arsenal thing and, and Arteta, I think people have got to give a lot of credit to the people above him yeah. because a year, 18 months ago, people were talking about him being out of his job. He's not suitable for Arsenal. But they stuck to their principle and backed the manager, which we know doesn't happen too often in football these days. And now they're bearing sort of the fruits of him sticking by him and, and where they are now in the division. And yeah. uh, on the cusp of nearly winning the Premier League, I'm like you, I think City will win it. But they're stuck by him and people deserve a lot of credit for doing that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you both said City there. I'm still getting nervous though. I'm, I'm a City fan, a City fan, Sam. If you haven't worked it out already, <laughs> I am starting to get nervous because we do have Brighton. We've still got to play Brighton. We've still got a few big games. So Leeds at the weekend. Leeds at Leeds at the weekend. <laughs> yeah, but I tell you what, this podcast is in jeopardy if Sam Allardyce stops my team winning the league. By the way, next season might not happen. Do you not want <laughs> Sam to win that game? No, I don't, Sam. No, you sorry, really? Sam. No. No, if my dad was manager of Leeds, I wouldn't want them to win. Like, <laughs> no. But there are the three games you do. Yes, the other. Three, I, hope, I hope he wins the other three games and absolutely smashes it. I think that's disgraceful. You don't want him to. But what can I say? I'm a true fan, Tim. The red mist is taking you over. You can lose three points, can't you? No, I don't want to. I want to win the game before the last game of the season. Okay. I don't want to. Be, I don't want to be one of the fans on the last day of the season that needs a result. I've had that too many years. I'd like to win it the game before, but that's Brighton. Right. So Sam was right about you. <laughs> <laughs> right. As always, we finish our podcast off with quick fire questions, Simon. But they don't have. We try to keep them quick, but they never are. Right. So mm. don't feel that they have to be one answer. Right. So best player that you've ever managed. Um. Well, given that I've listened to your podcast last week I think it was I, and he mentioned me as my his best manager I will have to say Jermaine Beckford nice <laughs> we have nice. A, we have a relationship that um, doesn't happen too often in football that he gets me I get him and we've been really successful together I remember signing him for Huddersfield and he did really well for me after the Leeds game um, I took him to Preston and the Preston one was really weird I know they're supposed to be quick fire questions see this is what happens and we like it carry on <laughs> So I rung Neil Lennon, Lennon up about signing another player from Bolton. And he went, you can't have him, but you can take your mate Beckford off me. Don't want him. Useless. He's not scored a goal. He's not done this. I went, oh, too right. I'll take him off you. Anyway, Peter Ridsdale, the chairman at Preston, got the money together. He scored something like 12 goals in 10 games, got a hat-trick in the playoff final after 55 minutes and got us promoted to the championships. And all the other goals, the winning goal of Bristol Rovers um, at Leeds United when scoring against Manchester United. So we've got this uh, relationship where we really get on and uh, yeah, we're good for each other. Do you speak to Lennon after that, by the way? Were you like, cheers Oh yeah, I told Lennon, it's sort of, sort of happy days. I give him a bit, bit of a promotion bonus. <laughs> <laughs> and the worst thing you want, like in that situation, Neil, the last thing he needs, give him a player who's not scoring for him and then he, ca he continues to score for someone you've just sold him to. It is a nightmare for yeah. a manager to do that. He didn't even sell me him. He gave me him for nothing. Give him for nothing. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, I can't remember if we asked you when you were on as a guest, but best player that you managed? Mm. Best players who worked out for me, yeah. Christian Benteke, I would say, uh, at, at Villa. Uh, that was an easy task, putting him back in the team because Paul Lambert didn't want him in the side. Um, so I brought him back in, told him some stuff I didn't necessarily believe in. Um, and he scored something like 13 goals to keep us in the Premier League at, in the first season. So he, he was great. Obviously, Chris, uh, Christian Eriksen, I think I might have mentioned to you before, was... It's a great example to any young kids at the club coming through. To his work ethic and the way he trains and and his his um, knowledge of the game just appreciates what the coach wants and and tries to send that message around to the rest of the players. He's just a leader, uh, a magnificent um, ambassador for any football club he ever plays for. So he would be right up there. And obviously the, the main man is who's Harry Kane, who's given an opportunity to play in the Premier League, and he and he took it with both hands and. 
we continued his development under Pochettino and now we've seen one of the, and we will see the greatest ever um, goal scorer in the Premier League in that man. I was good when Christian Eriksen signed for United as well. I am very, very bitter. Okay, who is the bigger club? Everton, Leeds or Leicester? Oh. Well, given that I've... Well, take Leicester out of it. Okay. But... I played for Leicester for five years, so I've sort of got a massive affiliation. And if two clubs want, I need to survive, want to survive in the Premier League, and both Leeds and Leicester and Everton can go down. But I'm good mates with Daishi as well, so there's a bit of bit of that as well. Everton, a big club, aren't they? Leicester won the Premier League. How do you judge a big club? Is know. it on titles, number of supporters? Yeah, that's the point. That it's, it's what, and or, does it matter? And is it I recent success or the past success? I've had this debate with many people. But in my order, it'd be Leeds, Leicester, and Everton. Okay. Do you think? I would say I'm going. Uh, I'm going joint top um, Everton and uh, and Leeds, and I'm gonna say Leicester. Will, and they're growing. You know, recent success made they are getting bigger, but they're not getting any taller. <laughs> I'm just. I'm my, that's my heart that's talking heart. rather than my I'm head. To be you. fair, that's all right. I respect that. <laughs> okay, Tim. What's your thoughts on Pedro Porro now? Uh, pretty much the same as as I've always felt about him. I, I just think he's a he's a he's a good footballer going forward. He wants to bomb forward, but when you ask him to be responsible and defend, it's it's, it's a problem to him and a problem to the team. Um, but I think used in the correct way as an offensive right sided player, I think there's a player in there. I'm not sure it was forty five million pounds worth of player that. Okay, and we've got two questions left. So Simon. We talk a lot on this podcast about tippy tappy football. Honestly, we talk a lot. Um, what are your thoughts on tippy tappy football? Um, I'm very much of the pragmatic footballer that if you can play up from the back and you've got the players to do it, then do it. But don't play take high risk football. If uh, if it's on to play a fifty yard pass forward with good quality, do that as well. If somebody's got time and space to play, then and it's a ten yard pass, then do that as well. I, I'm a mixture, me. People might say that I'm a, no, a low risk manager, but I'm just sensible. If I've got centre backs that can't handle the ball, but will head it and kick it and defend my eighteen yard box, I'll be happy with that. I wouldn't trust my goalkeeper to give it to him because there's more chances conceding by them trying to play out. But when they've got time and space to go and play. Um, I've never been fortunate to have players like Man City have week in week out where they can go bang 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 and pop it through. But not many clubs do. No, it is it is a lot. There's a lot of myth go, a myth that go around of tippy tappy football and people make a big thing of it. It's what, it, what it's what happens in both boxes. It doesn't matter how you get there for me. Defend that box, attack with flair, with gusto, with creativity, with positivity. That's that's for me. That's my style of football. Mm. A good example, Pep Guardiola. We, we would say he's the man who invented tippy tappy football, wouldn't we? Barcelona, the way they played. Now they played the biggest anticipated game we've had for a long time against Arsenal. You see how many long balls they played when Arsenal were putting a high press on. Mm -hmm. He finds a way. He wants them to play so they can attack the opposition. So Edison and Stones, they were just knocking it up to Haaland. He knows he's got a giant up there. He's just holding the ball up. Kevin De Bruyne is going and get it off him. They've got Grealish running down the outside. He finds a different way. He doesn't stick to the plan. The worst managers know we play with this philosophy. That is it. We stick to it. It's about jabbing them off you at times. If they come on, you need to go long. Then they drop off. Then you can play. Finding different ways. And I think your man is the genius at it, Pep Guardiola. It's not just rocket science, is it? No. If somebody's stopping you from playing, why can't you drop a 50-yard ball into a centre forward who's six foot three and hold it up and get the other space, other players into support him because there's so much space. If you've got time to play, go and play. It's like, like yeah. you used a good example, and I always say this, that I knew certain managers I was playing against exactly how they're going to play. Mm. And then I'd always beat them because they didn't have a way of playing to, to plan A, uh, from Change. plan A to plan B, plan C. And it isn't rocket science. People like mm. talk about this, that, and the other, and complicate it. Let the players go and play. Let them make decisions. And the best players make the best decisions for me. Absolutely. Thank you. And one last question, and it's for you, Tim. And um, we signed you up on a one-game deal, but do you fancy coming back next week? Can we sign you up for the season? Yeah, I'll, I'll ring my agent, and then uh, I'll get back to you. But like, I love it. I love it. It's all great, and. Uh, 
and I'll be back next week. Hooray. Don't worry Thank about you. it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Simon, thank you so much for being um, our guest today. It was absolutely perfect timing to no have worries. a former Leeds manager <laughs> on for this episode. Thank you so much and best of luck with um, Indi- with the Indian League next next season. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Thanks. So pleased you're able. See you next week. And thank you all for joining us on another episode of No Tippy Tappy Football brought to you by William Hill. <laughs>